have you with us on another Friday night. And uh, I hope you have had a great week. Looking forward to talking to you about not performing notes tonight. And I hope you all enjoyed the, um, the debate between me and Scott Carson. I hope you had a chance to watch that. If you didn't, you should definitely go back to the blog and check that out. We had so much fun. Um, uh, many of you know that was on Vena uh, Jones Cox's radio show. And I'm on her show a lot, have been for years. But I got to tell you, that was the most fun show ever. Everybody was raving about it. And, and I really want to preface this with Scott and I are friends, okay? So we like to rib each other and give each other a hard time. But the truth of the matter is that we are friends. And he has a great niche and he does really well with what he does. And you know what? So do I. It's just two different perspectives. And so when people say, should I do non-performing notes or should I do the, the seller carrybacks? There, there is no wrong or right answer. For me, it's seller carrybacks. However, sometimes I do like to buy the non-performing, but for the most part, I have always preferred to do the seller carrybacks. It's just what I like, okay? But different people have different ideas. They have different goals. They are in different situations in their life. And so that's something that you need to decide for yourself. So tonight, I thought I would talk about the pros and cons of doing the non-performing notes. And I'll show you a couple deals. I actually have a live deal that um, I'm going to go over. And maybe one of you might be interested in investing in it. But it's a live deal that we can talk about the pros and cons of it as well. Um, so for starters, I need to tell you that I, I've... I've started doing non -perform I started out with seller carrybacks, but I did my first non-performing notes like in the early 1990s. And certainly when the market started crashing uh, after 2000, uh, after 9-11, it, it actually had started going down then. Uh, we were doing tons of short sales and, and I was teaching everybody. I was on the bandwagon saying, hey, instead of doing a short sale, buy the note. It's the ultimate short sale, you know, and I was calling banks and educating them. And, you know, everybody was on the short sale bandwagon. Well, I would start out like I was, you know, doing a short sale. I say, hey, don't you guys ever sell a note? Wouldn't it be a lot easier if I just bought the note? And inevitably what would happen is, you know, they would wind up talking to their pre-foreclosure department or their foreclosure department and, and they would come back and say, yeah, we'd sell the note. And hey, by the way, I've got six more of these in Ohio. Are you interested? And so it was really a matter of educating the banks that, hey, we are a viable resource for you to take these defaulted loans off your hands. Well, then, of course, after the downturn, it became extremely popular. And I had banks calling me saying, hey, we've got all these notes. You know, are, are you interested in them? Can you pass them out to your to your clients? And so that's what really broke everything wide open. And it became really sexy, if you will, to buy the non-performing notes. But um so about that time, I had a huge office. I had seven people working for me. We had a pipeline going of over 50 deals at any given time. But understand, that was a different time for me. I loved that, thoroughly loved it. And, and, but I had the support staff to help me. Well, since then, I've moved back home. You can see my home office. I love being at home. I don't want employees again. I don't want a pipeline of 50 deals. I love doing deals here and there when I feel like it. If I don't feel like it, I don't do them. And that's what gives me the time to be with my six grandkids now. And so I'm just in a different place in my life now. And that no longer is appealing to me. However, it might be appealing to you. And that's what you need to decide. But one of the things that really bothers me is it's not as easy and risk-free as a lot of people think it is. And so my general advice is that if you're new to notes or new to real estate, I would recommend that you um, start with the seller carrybacks, okay? And I'm not going to get into seller carrybacks tonight, but I'm just saying the seller carrybacks 
they, the way that I teach you to do them, they really are risk-free because first of all, you're not going to have any of your own money invested in it and you get the deal under contract there. I have the best weasel clause you'll ever find so that if you don't get it resold, you can back out of it. It's no problem. You're not under any obligation to move forward if you're not able to. And so for that reason, especially for a new person, I highly recommend that you uh, start with the seller carrybacks. Learn the verbiage, learn how the deal flows, get an understanding of what a discounted note is. Do a couple of those. And if you're comfortable with that, then move on to doing the defaulted loans. But I certainly wouldn't start out with a defaulted loan. Okay. And the reason is it's just too risky. Um, before I get in to the risk, Everybody's been e emailing me say, well, where do we find these defaulted notes? So why don't we talk about that real quick? And, and let's, let's go through that and I can, uh, and then we'll talk, we'll go through some real deals and then I'll tell you why I think that the, that they are more risky and so forth. Okay. Hopefully this is going to work. Well, there we go. I'm getting technical. Can you tell? Okay. So where do we find the non-performing notes? Well, the easiest way is just to buy from resellers. Okay. There are a ton of people out there that they've made contacts with the banks, hedge funds, uh, and, and, they have the, the inside track on that. And what they'll do is they will buy a huge pool. What happens is it's like a food chain. And so the, um, at the top, you've got the big banks. And by the way, you're wasting your time if you're going to try to buy from the big five, like the Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase. They don't sell notes. So I wouldn't even waste your time with them. But it is the smaller community banks that will sell their notes. And so what my most successful students have done is they have gone personally, you know, some call on the phone, but I know a number of them have actually gone to local credit unions and community banks. And they, they just go around and explain that, Hey, you know, I'm an investor. I'm looking for some defaulted loans to buy and let me know if you're interested because I, I would be interested in buying some of your defaulted loans. So that is an easy way to make contact yourself. However, um, there are a lot of people that what happens is the big banks, they will sell pools to the um, to hedge funds. And then the hedge funds will let me switch this out here so I can follow you. I think we're good there. So. Um, they, they will sell to large hedge funds. The he, those hedge funds sell to smaller hedge funds who sell, sell to smaller ones. And then they're selling to asset management companies and the mom and pop investors. And it just goes on down the line. Okay. Until eventually you get to the people who will sell what is called a one off. Okay. One off means that you can look at a pool or a spreadsheet. Um, they call it a tape because it used to be literally a tape, but now it's usually a spreadsheet. And you can go through and cherry pick what notes you're interested in. Okay. And that's how I usually acquire my notes just because I have so many people that send me pools. And so as long as I'm able to cherry pick, I pick the ones that are local to me and that's how I, I buy them. Okay. So that is probably the easiest way is to buy them from other people. However, you got to watch out because First of all, you can't trust everybody out there. I hate to tell you and ask me how I know. I mean, I'm talking about people that I had known for a number of years who I trusted, who I believed in and found that they were not reputable at all, that they did not treat investors the way they wanted to be treated. I will tell you a story. I was at a convention and I was talking to one of these resellers. And while we were talking, this woman came up and was discussing that she was going to buy second, uh, a pool of second mortgages from this man for 60 cents on the dollar. Now, granted, maybe there were 
there's some great seconds out there that are worth that. But in general, I knew that that was way too much for the seconds. And so she walked away and I said, you're getting 60 cents on the dollar for seconds. And he said, yeah, isn't that great? And I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, no. He, he said, and you know what? If she didn't want him, I got a dozen other people that would take him. And it was like he totally knew that she was not going to make money on those. But it's like they were so hot and everybody wanted to jump on the defaulted second bandwagon that they were willing to overpay. You've probably seen it if you've gone to a foreclosure. You go to the auctions and sometimes there's people bidding up properties like crazy and they're all overpaying and nobody can buy anything because it's just not a good deal. Only the people that don't know any better wind up buying. And the same thing happens with notes. And so you need to know who you're buying from. You also need to make sure that you have good documentation. Um, you need to know if, if they're giving you any warranties, uh, what, what are their representations? Um, you know, what are their commitments to you? Are they guaranteeing anything? Um, if it's not what they told you, will they buy it back? And more importantly, do they have the wherewithal to buy it back? They can say they'll buy it back, but if, if they don't have cash available, maybe they won't, you know? So it is important to know who you're buying from. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that a lot of times the, all of the good notes have already been cherry picked by the people that are selling them. And if not them, somebody else. And so you want to know how long that pool has been available and has it been shopped all over? You know, are, are you going to be bidding against a bunch of people? What I want to know is if the people are exclusive. Okay. I want to know it, it, the, that's the ideal thing. If you have an in, say, with the vice president of a bank, maybe you have a good friend who's a vice president, and he says, hey, I got these non-performing notes, and I'll give you first dibs on them. You take a look, see if you want them, they're yours. And if not, then I'll put them out to my list. That is an exclusive, and that is really a great lead. And so then you can go in and you know that you can get a reasonable price on them without somebody bidding you up and getting in this price war kind of thing. So you, you need to be aware that sometimes by the time these pools get to you, they're already picked over, which is okay as long as you are aware of it and you're paying accordingly. You don't want to be paying 50 cents on the dollar for what's just garbage that's maybe worth 10 or 20 cents on the dollar. Or maybe it's in war zones or something like that where you don't want it at any cost. So you just need to go in with your eyes open and know what you're getting. Okay. Um, so you need to know who you're buying from. You need to know the quality of the note and you need to do your own due diligence. Don't just accept their word for it. Okay. And then you need to be aware of what is the going price, you know, in the marketplace for whatever type of note that you're looking at. And it can be all across the board. So if you have that knowledge, then buying from a reseller is probably the easiest way for you to go. Okay. Let's switch over here again. After I do this a couple times, I'll be a lot quicker. Okay. So this is kind of funny because I heard through the grapevine that someone told, uh, someone said, Don is telling people that it's okay to call the homeowner. Well, anybody who's doing non-performing notes knows that if you're getting notes from the bank, you can't call the homeowner. Okay. You will be blacklisted. There's privacy laws and you cannot contact them. OK, but what they don't know is I have another way of finding distress notes. And quite honestly, it is a little bit more time consuming. But you know what? You get great quality notes. And usually you do have an exclusive where they're not being shopped around. Uh, and this is how I started out. Uh, when I would start marketing for short sales, I had my from the heart letter and I would send it out. And then once the people would respond, then I would call the bank. And like I said, start out like a short sale and convert to a note purchase. Well, 
I don't do short sales anymore. Okay. So if you're going to do this, um, you need to have a plan. First of all, I would only send letters where the lender is a small community bank. Okay. Uh, so that would be for starters. Um, but so, so you know that it's a qualified lead to begin with. And then I'd also have somebody in the wings that if it happens to turn out to be a short sale, that you could maybe collect a thousand dollar referral fee just by, you know, passing it off to them and letting them finish it as, as a short sale. But the reason that this is such a great quality lead is that most of the time, no one else is working with them. Okay. And it allows you not only to talk to the homeowner, but you can meet them. You can go through the house. So you know whether the homeowner wants to stay, whether they want to leave, whether they're already gone, you know what the condition of the property is in. And God forbid, if it does go to foreclosure, if you have to go bid, you know you're, you're probably the only one in there standing at the auction that has been inside the house. Okay. And so it's a matter of, the, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Do you want to go to the bank and find out, you know, who, what notes they have that they'll sell? Or do you want to go find the notes and then contact the bank and see if they want to sell? And it's, it's your call. Um, like I said, that's a little bit more time consuming, but you get a much higher quality lead for that. Okay. But it is important to recognize that if you are buying defaulted notes off of, um, a list or from a bank, you cannot contact the homeowner. That is a, a huge, huge no-no. Okay. The other thing that you can do is go directly to the banks. And like I said, you can either call them uh, or you can um, go visit them in person. And to me, that's the highest quality um, because you're going direct to them. You are, well, it's possible you could go direct to them and not still not be exclusive, but certainly you would know that in talking with them. Okay. And I think that's where you absolutely get the best price. Um, I'll tell you a little story. And this goes back many years ago. Um, this is one of my students who came to my first academy and I have no idea if she's on this call or not, but she'll recognize the story <laughs> if she is. And what she did was she went around and she started, she went to all the community banks in her own like surrounding counties. Okay. And once a month she would go and she would talk to a vice president, president of the bank, that kind of thing. And she would explain, I buy non-performing notes. Do you have any dogs on your books? You know, and she did this repeatedly and you have to be persistent. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that new people make is that they're not persistent. You know, if you can go to your first bank and get some notes, that's awesome, but it's not the norm. Okay. And so she went around and she, um, after going several months, she gets a call from the president of this bank and he says, Hey, could you come Tuesday night and make a presentation? The board wants to know exactly what you, what you're proposing. And so she went, explained where she was at. She wound up, wound up buying seven non-performing notes from that bank in her IRA, by the way. And that was the beginning of her building a huge business. And then the, the president of the bank took her out to lunch. And he said, you know, this is a great service that you provide. You should, you know, go, go around to other banks because there, there's a lot of banks that would like to know you. And she says, well, you know, I've been trying and I've been calling and I just can't get in to see anybody. And he says, well, who, who have you tried to reach? And she, she reaches into her um, purse and she pulls out a stack of index cards and she starts saying, you know, I, I went over to such and such a bank and I talked to Bill Smith and, and I tried to get to see him and I couldn't. And the guy says, hey, you, you tell Bill, here's his cell phone number. Call him up. Tell him that I said that he needs to talk to you and tell him that I'm going to kick his butt when we play golf this weekend. You know, it was that kind of stuff. And, and she went through her whole stack of index cards. And this guy is giving her phone numbers and referrals and personal information so that she would have, so they'd know that she had personally 
talk to this man and that he had referred him. And so what happened was she had broke into the good old boy circle, if you know what I mean. And so she got a ton of business from all over. And that's how she started building her business. And if you remember, what I teach you is without a doubt, your best source of notes is networking. And it doesn't matter whether it's non-performing or whether it's performing. It's all about networking. You can't sit home and expect deals just to come to you like crazy. It's not going to happen. You need to get out. You need to be in the marketplace, you know, and, and that's what's important to do so that you can find the deals. Um, I will tell you that as far as the pros and cons of finding deals between seller finance notes and the non-performing, I do think that non-performing nowadays are easier to find. However, the, the downside of that is they may not be a good quality note, okay? Um, you have a lot of competition chasing them, okay? Um, and then you can just look in general at do you want to do non-performing notes? Here's the deal. And I'm going to show you some of both. You can make a lot of money on non-performing notes, but only you know if it is worth the risk and if it's worth the time. So let's, let's just talk about that for a second here. Uh, here we go. Oh, I had some more on there. I forgot to pull up. By, I, I need to go back to this. As far as finding contacts for non-performing notes and seller finance notes, um, LinkedIn is a great, great source. If you don't have a LinkedIn presence, you need, what I would do is I would get on YouTube and there's all kinds of people that they'll have like a, a six week class on how to do, uh, uh, how to build a, a business with LinkedIn, man, I would be doing that in a heartbeat if I were you. And then smiling and dialing, which we already kind of talked about. Okay, so when you look at a list of non-performing notes, first of all, I would try to get an idea of what that note is all about. Like, and, and what are your goals? Do you want the property? Are you out to use the, the note is a backdoor of to getting the property or um, are, are you wanting to um, get the note and keep the homeowner in the house and then rehab that note? Okay. If you want the property, when you're going through the spreadsheet, you've got to look for signs of a distressed homeowner. If the property is vacant, that's a dead giveaway. We like to call that a clue. Um, if there's a lot of deferred maintenance, there's a good chance that they might want to get rid of it. Um, no pride of ownership. You know what I mean by pride of ownership? Um, are there flowers planted in the front yard? You know, is, is it relatively clean? You know, that kind of thing. Um, are they trying to take care of it, even though they may not have money to do everything? In general, are they trying to take care of the property? Um, have they paid their taxes or not? Okay. If, um, if they're, really far behind in their taxes, that can be a major stressor and where they feel like they're just going to have to get out, that there's no hope of them keeping it. And what is their credit situation? Do they have poor credit? Are they facing bankruptcy? You know, what is the general situation? And somebody actually had sent me a question asking on the non-performing notes, are there other liens on the property? A lot of times there are other liens on the property. Let me tell you. Um, the thing is that you've got to realize these people have been in trouble. And so there's a good chance they've got medical judgments. There's a good chance that the real estate taxes are sky high defaulted real estate taxes. And so that's part of the downside of buying the non-performing notes because you don't know what you're going to run into. However, okay. A lot of times you can buy those other liens at a discount. And that's where a lot of people miss the boat. They think that they've got to pay those other liens off. When the fact is, if you take the time to call them up, you, a lot of times you can buy them at a discount. I know one lady in at, from the Cincinnati Rio Group, she negotiated discounts on 17 liens, 17 liens on one property. And uh, that way she didn't have to foreclose. 
Okay, but if you're not able to buy those, then you need to go ahead, foreclose, and wipe them out. Okay, you absolutely need to be aware that if there are liens on the property and you don't do something about it before you get that deed, then you, you could be having a problem, you know, because you might have to pay them off in full. So deal with the other liens, buy them at a discount or foreclose and wipe them out. So anyway, if you get the spreadsheet for non-performing notes, do you see here how if you're wanting the property, then look, look, go through the spreadsheet and see if you can tell, you know, you think that these people have already moved? And a lot of times whoever gives you the spreadsheet can tell you. And normally I, what I see is it's, it's a, often a mixture, okay? So on the other hand, you can also make a lot of money by keeping the homeowner in the house. And if you wanna keep the homeowner in the house, then you need to look for a homeowner who is making an effort, okay? Are the more other mortgages current? Okay, if 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 everything else is current but this one, it, it, they haven't given up yet. They're still trying. You know what I mean? Um, are the taxes current? A lot of times they'll pay the taxes, they'll pay the other mortgages, but there's just this one note that they can't take care of. Is the property clean and in reasonably good condition? You know what? I think I said that backwards before when we were talking about if you want, a, if you're wanting the property, you want to look for properties that aren't taken care of. But if you're wanting uh, to, to, um, because that, that indicates that the homeowner doesn't care, doesn't want the property, may be gone. But if you're wanting to hold the paper, then you do want someone who has that pride of ownership that is taking care of the property. And you can see that they're really trying to keep the house. So there's that pride of ownership that I was talking about. And do they have reasonable credit? Um, most people are in default. Their credit's going to have some glitches on it. But you can kind of tell people who have, who, who have um, there's the habitual uh, person who's always going to be late no matter what. And then there's someone who's gone through a bad time. And for me, when I'm wanting to keep somebody in the house, I'm looking for someone who is not habitually late. Okay. So let's stop right here. Move back over here. Okay. So this brings us to what I was talking about um, when I mentioned that uh, as far as what I like to do. I since I'm back at home and working from my home and I'm by myself, I, I, Matthew helps me. I shouldn't say I'm by myself, but I don't have a big staff and a bunch of employees. And so I don't want to spend the time that it takes to do the non-performing notes. Okay. Um, I'm not set up to analyze a hundred notes in a half hour. I don't have all the computer programs to do that. Um, I don't, I certainly don't want to be buying non-performing notes in another state. Now, mind you, there are a lot of people that do that and they do it very successfully. Okay. But that's because they've established contacts with people. There are national companies that you can hire that will do your property management. You can hire national appraisers, national title companies. Shoot, you can hire people that they will go knock on the door, get the homeowner on the cell phone and say, hey, hey, here, the owner of the property wants to talk to you. I mean, that can be done. But quite frankly, when, when I look at the trouble that it takes to deal with a non-performing note and all of the time. I mean, it's not just hands-on time of working with it, but the calendar time. It's nothing to take a year or two or more to work out a non-performing note. And when I compare that with how easy it is to do the seller finance notes, like it doesn't make any sense for me to do non-performing notes. It's just not what I like to do. And it's, I can make higher rates of return with the seller carrybacks. Now, on the other hand, if you're set up to do the non-performing notes like that, and you like doing that, by all means, you can make very good money at it. It's, it just depends on what is your cup of tea. So nowadays, my primary goal, if I'm gonna buy a non-performing note, um, then I'm going to use it as a backdoor to getting the property. Okay. Um, and 
I think that that's the most important time for me to buy it because I do want, I, I, I've told you before that um, I think it's important for you to have a balanced portfolio. Okay. And you should have some properties and some notes. Now, without a doubt, I always prefer my notes and I make much, much higher rates of return um, on those deals. However, you want some of the property. If you're able to deal with it, you want some of the property because you want the appreciation and you want the tax benefits. Okay. So keep that in mind and try to get some kind of balance. Your balance might be like this and mine might be like this, but the idea is keep in mind that there are benefits to doing both. Okay. And so right now, my son, Ben, many of you know him, he's a local attorney here and he and I are building up a, a real estate portfolio. And so, when I get a spreadsheet and it's got notes in the area where I'm going to buy, man, I cherry pick those notes and I use those notes to get the property. One little house I got, uh, I bought the, the note on for $11,000. I borrowed $25,000, which covered the purchase price and the rehab. Okay. I have a fella in there right now who is doing the rehab and living in the house at the same time. I'm going to sell it to him. I'll probably sell it for 50,000, maybe 60,000. Okay. So now understand I've got a $25,000 first on it. If let's say I turn around and sell it for 50. Now I just made 25 grand. Okay. And what I can do is if I sell it to him on seller financing, then I could either wrap the note. And this is something we're going to talk about at the Academy. And if you, if you don't know about the Academy, you need to get to my website and check it out. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but man, we go over all this kind of really cool stuff at the Academy. And so one of the things that you could do is wrap that mortgage. Okay. So I might, if my investor wants to stay in the deal for longer term, then what I'll do is I'll sell it to this homeowner who's doing the rehab on it or soon to be home over owner, I should say the occupant, the tenant. And um, I would sell it to them. And then I, I would just wrap the investor's mortgage. That means I would keep it in place. And so the, the tenant's going to pay me and I'm going to turn around and pay the investor. Okay. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is I could take that $50,000 mortgage and I could sell part of it. I could sell enough to pay off the $25,000 first. And then I would just keep the tail end of that, uh, that mortgage. And that would be my profit from the deal. There's all kinds of really cool things that you can do. And I, I to me, um, being able to incorporate the notes into your real estate business, I think that's where you see just amazing profits. And there's just, you can do more deals that you wouldn't have ever otherwise been able to do. Okay. And so that's, that's where I'm at as far as um, when I want to buy a defaulted note, generally it's because I want to use it as leverage to get the property. Okay. Um, that's just where I'm at. Um, so I hope that that's been helpful to you to kind of set, set that apart. Um, right now I want to go to, uh, I want to share a deal with you. I love this deal. Um, this was done by um, one of the investors, Jim. Here we go. And he got this idea when he was sitting at the Note Buyers Academy. And, and this, this deal is going to make you want to do non-performing notes. Okay. I'm trying to give you both sides of it. Because as much as I hate the headaches of dealing with it, it, it can be worthwhile. Okay. So I think we're on here now. Okay. Okay. So Jim spots this 14,000 square foot uh, warehouse and it is for sale. And he figures that based on the square footage that it would have a fair market value of approximately $784,000. Okay. He notices that back in 2009, the listing price was only $599,000. $599, and what he saw was every year the property, the price kept going down, down, down. And it was reduced in 2012 all the way down to $199,000. 
why in the world didn't it sell? You know, and it really piqued his interest. This is the difference in how, why you get a deal and why you don't. For most people, they would look at this and go, something's wrong with that. I'm not going to waste my time on it. Jim said, something's wrong with this. There's probably a good deal here. And so he checked it out and he found out that it was really a nightmare. There was $150,000 in federal and state tax liens on it. Um, there was a $190,000 first mortgage that was in default. There are a bunch of mechanic liens and utility liens. It needed a lot of repairs. The owner was in a really nasty divorce and filing bankruptcy. And there were $45,000 in property taxes that had been sold at the county auction. And the owner didn't redeem them in time. And so now we've really got a problem. So Jim's taking a look at this and he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. He literally was sitting in the Note Buyers Academy and he said, you know what? I decided I'm going to try to buy this note. And at this point now, the unpaid balance, UPB is unpaid balance, was over $190,000. And he's thinking that maybe he could do a note modification with the owner. If not, he was going to foreclose and wipe out all the liens and sell the property. And so he goes, now remember, the, the first mortgage here was, um, it, it had a, it, it, an unpaid balance of over $190,000. Jim offers $1,500 for this deal, okay? $1,500 for the note. Well, the bank said no, obviously. So he goes back and now he offers $15,000, okay? $15,000. Um, and do you know that the bank agreed? On a $190,000 note, the bank agreed to take 15. Why would they do that? You know why? Because they're looking at this tax lien out there and they're thinking they're not going to get the property. They don't want to pay the $45,000 in taxes. They're not going to do that. Okay. So they're probably thinking they're going to collect their attorney fees and that'd be better than nothing. So Jim gets them under contract with the note purchase agreement where they're committed to sell it to him for $15,000. And then he gets to work, he hires an attorney and the attorney reviews the tax deed situation. And guess what? He discovers that the tax lien holder had failed to file the tax deed within the required statutory period, which means the tax deed goes away. There's no problem now. So the very thing that was keeping everybody from doing this deal is now a moot point. Isn't that awesome? So, so now all of a sudden this is a sweet, sweet deal. So Jim verifies that all the liens are going to be wiped out. He buys the note. He contacts the homeowner. The homeowner was very, very cooperative, but he didn't want to do a loan mod. And so he actually offered to help Jim do the foreclosure. So Jim foreclosed on the property and he wound up with a $784,000 property for $15,000 plus about 4,000 in attorney fees. So for $19,000, he's got a fair market rent of $77,000 a year, $77,000 a year based on a $19,000 investment forever. <laughs> okay. Does that make you want to do non-performing notes? And that's a sweet deal. And they're out there. There are plenty of them out there. But now let's talk about the downside. First of all, this took him several years to do. Okay. And I remember talking to him and he had money tied up and he was having to come up with more money and he's, you know, um, well, I shouldn't say that. It was the attorney fees and stuff. But then he was looking at, should, am I going to have to pay off the 45000 which he didn't. It, it wound up nice because he was able to foreclose and wipe out those other liens. So that all worked out well. Um, but I think a big thing is having staying power. If you're not able to stay in the deal, this probably isn't the best example because this was pretty sweet that he got it for 19000 but what I have found is that when you buy a note, for example, I had one deal. It took me over a year after I paid for it. It took me closer to a year and a half to get the deed from the bank. So I'm sitting here with this property. I can't do anything with it. I don't have the deed. 
Okay. And I'm certainly not going to put more money into it until I have the deed. Meanwhile, taxes are going up and they're getting ready. The defaulted taxes are, you know, and, and they're getting ready to foreclose. I wound up, I had to put out more money for the delinquent taxes. Otherwise I was going to lose it to the tax foreclosure. So you can buy a defaulted note. And the difference is like, if you buy a seller carry back, the owner of the property is going to pay the insurance, the taxes, the, any assessments that come up, anything that goes wrong, they're responsible for it. But on a non-performing note, guess what? That's going to come out of your pocket. And so if you don't have the wherewithal to come up with any assessments that pop up to keep the taxes current or to you know pay on them, keep them out of foreclosure, um, if you don't have time to mow the grass so you don't get a $500 penalty because the grass wasn't mowed, um, if you're not able to handle that, then you should not be doing the non-performing notes. A better idea, start with the seller carrybacks. Build up your cash so that you've got a reserve. Then go do a gym deal, okay? Go buy the non-performing note, but get some money behind you before you start buying the non-performing notes because although they can be great deals, you need to have staying power and you need to have cash to take care of any incidental things that might come up, okay? just to protect your interest. Okay. Um, I want to share with you, this is a real deal that is available right now. And let me tell you about it. This is something that a student sent and he is looking for a partner. And quite frankly, I would love to do the deal, but I've got the Academy coming up. I'm majorly overloaded. And this is why I don't coach on the non-performing uh, deals because I just don't have time to deal with them. And so he is looking for a partner. So if this sounds like something that you're interested in, and if you are an experienced note buyer and an experienced investor, and you have cash available, then email me if you're interested. Okay. And we'll talk about it. So I believe I'm, I'm almost positive. He said he called bank, different banks. And he came up with this. It was a small pool. I don't remember exactly how many, but uh, I think there were seven in the pool. And he wound up and he's got two notes under contract. Um, let's just talk about the one so I can give you an idea and you can see the potential. I want you to see the pros and the cons. So this house, the BPO on it is 725,000. So he's thinking that he could sell it for at least 700. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I've not checked it out. Um, but that's a, a good start. Okay. It is a real BPO. Um, the borrowers owe 324,000 plus 18,000 or excuse me, 78,000 in arrears. It's um, just over $400,000. So they owe over four, just let's call it 400,000 and the house, let's say is worth 700,000. They've been living there rent free basically for a number of years. Haven't been making any payments on this mortgage. Okay. Clearly there is a lot of equity there. And clearly if you buy this note, there is the possibility that maybe you could do get them to agree to a loan mod. They've lived there for a long time. Maybe you could restructure that and keep them in the house, make some money on it. Okay. Or maybe not. Maybe you would have to foreclose and take the house from them. But even if you did that, there's like a good $300,000 worth of equity there. However, you've got to weigh that out. How long would it take for you to get the property? Um, in my looking at it, it seems like these people are not making an effort. I, I, I would be afraid that they would be the type that would file bankruptcy. And first, you know, the, the husband files and the wife files and, you know, and they go back and forth on that and that they could tie it up for a long time. Now, still, there's a lot of equity there, but if you don't have staying power where you can stay in the deal and protect your interest, then that's not going to help you any. The other thing I think is that this requires a bulldog. I'm not a bulldog. 
I shouldn't say that though, because if you make me mad or if I think you're taking advantage of me, then I'm a bulldog. <laughs> Sometimes people mistake my kindness for weakness. Well, let me tell you, you don't want to make me mad. Okay. But in general, I don't like conflict. And that's another reason that I prefer the seller carrybacks. My inclination is if somebody can't pay, let them stay there. They must need a place to live. You know, that's just what's in my heart most of the time. And so it, that doesn't work out so well if that's your, your livelihood is doing defaulted notes. So anyway, so if that appeals to you, that property is up in Michigan. And if you think that you would like to know more about it, I've got all the paperwork on it. And uh, this fella is looking for a money partner as well. I, he's a new investor. So it's not just a matter of needing the money. He needs somebody to walk through the deal and he wants to participate in some fashion. So if that appeals to you, by all means, send me an email uh, at Donna Bauer at the notebuyer.com where info is easier. Info at the notebuyer.com. Okay. How are we doing on time here? Um, Matthew, uh, let's see what we've got here. We've got a couple questions. Um, I think I'd like to hold those questions. Well, uh, never mind. Okay, so um, Eugene wants to know, uh, do we need to fill out an SEC form for the state that we buy in? Um, the reason I don't want to address that is because every, every deal is different and every, every situation is different. If you do your deals the way I teach you to do them, you're going to be acting as a principal in the transaction and you wouldn't, it's, it's completely different than if you're buying pools of notes, if you've done a private offering. Um, what I would recommend, Eugene, is that you talk to an attorney. Because if you're in a position right now where you have to fill out that form, then you're in a different situation than I'm in, okay? So I would recommend that you ask your securities attorney on that. For me, I, I am very careful the way that I do my deals. I do one deal at a time. I use one investor at a time. Um, I don't pool people's money. I always act as a principal in the transaction. I buy the note and then I turn around and I sell it to somebody else. And so I'm very, very careful that I don't cross the line on anything. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of people out there that they have talked to um, their attorney and they've set up, um, they have set up funds. And depending on the type of fund, different laws apply to them. So to ask me a general question about it, I, I can't tell you because I don't know what your particular uh, situation is. Um, and Nancy, I want to thank you for sharing the video with your Facebook group. I appreciate that. And Matthew, if you would put those back up for me, let me see what the other one was. Um, Nathan, uh, let me address your, your question. Um, his question is that uh, banks must report to the FDIC quarterly. What I recommend getting on the FDIC's website to find banks with large non-accrual assets for target marketing. Um, that's not my cup of tea, so I wouldn't do it. But um, I, that's not what I would do, okay? But, but you might do it if that works for you and you're comfortable doing that, by all means. I think that the more that you get, get involved with people in the industry, and if that doesn't work, you might be talking to somebody else that has a different lead for you, okay? So I, I would give it a shot, okay? Um, Matthew, um, what are we doing about our giveaway? Did you oh, I will come up with the winner in a second. I'll choose one randomly, give you a minute, though. Okay, okay, will do. Um, Okay, let me see what else we got here. I think that was the end of that. Um, oh, okay. So I hope I've given you something to think about as far as whether you want to do the non-performing or the seller carrybacks. Um, if you're doing the non-performing, 
know that you can make huge profits on them, but you need to be prepared. You need to understand that there are many different exit strategies. And though you may plan on keeping the homeowner in the house, they could be long gone. You may plan on getting the house and it could be tied up for several years in bankruptcy and other things. You never know. But so you just have to be able, you got to have staying power. That's the best way I know to say it. And you need to have some money behind you. And so if that's the case, the non-performing notes can be a, a great money-making opportunity. Um, the other thing is there is a way you can do non-performing notes with no risk. And we haven't even talked about that. If, if you have a really good contact with a bank, maybe you know a vice president of a bank or something like that, and if they will give you an exclusive opportunity to buy their notes, you could flip those notes to private investors, okay? So don't take owner, well, you do take ownership. You buy the note and you resell it to a private investor. But my point is you can flip it for a quick 10,000, 20,000, 5,000, whatever the note would, would uh, bear, you know, depending on the deal. But my point is that if you flip a note or assign your contract on a note, then in that case, that, that's a no risk situation. Okay. And so I would definitely consider that if you have um, a good contact like that. Okay. So the winner of the negotiating audio classes for tonight is Barry O'Neill. Congratulations, Barry. You're going to love the negotiating CDs or they're actually audio classes and uh, Matthew will send you the links to them. Uh, I know a lot of you already have them uh, and we've gotten a lot of great reviews on them. Um, Gil Weiss is a friend of mine and he and I wrote that course years ago. He is a master negotiator and uh, we put that together. We've got a lot of examples, real estate examples and everything there. And it's, it's, it is a great course and it's good for just life in general. So I hope Barry that you enjoy that. Um, okay, we've got another question from Nathan. Uh, does Dodd-Frank come into play when you look to restructure a non-performing note to get it performing again? Nathan, you've got good questions. <laughs> you know, that is a funny one because that depends on who you talk to. Uh, some people say it absolutely does and other people say, no, it doesn't. So what I would recommend is that you talk to an attorney and you get advice from an attorney who's willing to stand behind it, okay? Um, I would get the advice in writing. Many people say that since the note has already, um, it, it's already been created, it's in default, that, that you don't, there's no licensing issues, nothing like that, and you can just go ahead and restructure it. Now, I would say this, I certainly, I would not knowingly modify a non-performing note that did not comply. You know what I'm saying? So for, for example, if, if it's a situation where a balloon note is not allowed, I sure wouldn't put a balloon on it. I mean, I would do what I could to try to comply with it. Um, I think it depends on the situation. Uh, and like I said, it, it see, I've, I always take the safe route. And for example, before Dodd-Frank ever was around, in Ohio, there's a law that on a residential loan that you have to give uh, the people at least five years to pay. So whenever I did a modification, it didn't apply to modifications, but in my way of thinking, I'm always going to give them at least five years to pay. Why would I, why would I create a possible problem? You know what I mean? Um, so I think it just, it, I would get an opinion from an attorney. That probably didn't help you, but I'm sorry. That's my, that's my answer. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, so um, okay. Uh, there is a question from Chris and um, Chris, I meant to email you and just didn't have a chance because I was traveling this week. Um, Chris and many other people have asked this. When you go to buy, and we're switching gears here to seller carrybacks. When you go to buy a seller carryback note, 
what uh, when you want to buy your list, what should you ask for? I would recommend that um, first of all, it's nice to have properties that are worth at least seventy five thousand. Okay, uh, I've done them where they're fifty, but what you don't want. I just had a, a, a student send me. I think it was seven seven notes, and the properties were all worth twenty five thirty thousand dollars. I mean, that's that's an indication that that's not a very good area. And I just did not want to go there with it. There were other reasons too. That was not the only reason. But um, I would try to, to go with um, a house that has that's worth at least 75,000. It's nice to have a note balance of at least 50,000. Um, typically you want some seasoning on it, but here's the thing. I always started, as soon as that note was created, I would start sending my letters out and I would send the letters once a quarter because marketing people will tell you that you need to touch a person three times before they respond. And so my thought was if I start sending these out right away, then by the time that it's seasoned, which seasoning is how long have you collected payments, and most investors like to have six to 12 months of seasoning. So by the time it gets to where it's seasoned and you'd want to buy it, now they've already seen it three times in your letter and they'll call you up and want to sell. So I would look for that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else in particular. Um, okay, I think that's that's it. Chris, I think that's it for what I would, would ask for specifically. You can do any uh, states. Uh, uh, Florida and Texas are always really hot. But you know what? A note is a note. And it doesn't matter whether it's on a property in Idaho or in Florida. The people still have just as much desire to sell it, you know. Um, so I wouldn't let that hold me up. Um, before we close, I want to talk to you about the Note Buyers Academy. Uh, so let's switch over to that real quick. If you have not checked that out, you need to go to the website. Um, let's see if we can get that up here. Okay. Um, it's the notebuyer.com. And I'm just going to run through this real quick. So understand that the early bird special is going on right now, okay? Uh, the early bird special is good uh, through the end of this month. So if you're thinking about coming, you need to register now. Um, this is in, we, we hold this in, it's actually Covington, Kentucky. And Covington um, has a great river view of the, the Cincinnati riverfront okay it's right across the river here's a picture of us last year uh on friday on saturday night we do a uh, I, I we do a dinner boat cruise and i i take you on this really nice cruise b and b river boats it's like a um they have replicas of the old paddle boats and we just get away from the the hustle and bustle or the you know the grind of the the seminar and get away and have some fun and enjoy the river so that's us on the river there um visit the website, check out these videos. You know, it was literally by popular demand that I decided to make this an annual event. I, I've done these for years and I usually would do like four a year and I go to all different cities and I decided, hey, it, it's time just to, let's just have them in Cincinnati. And when we got to, to uh, Sunday afternoon, everybody said, Donna, you need to make this an annual event. And I, I said, no, because I can't keep coming up with new material. They said, that's all right. There's so much material here. We, you, we just keep coming for the same thing again. So um, and inevitably, we get a half a dozen people who some of them have been four, five, six times, and they keep coming back. Because not only is it four days of me teaching you about notes, but you get the education and you get the synergy of being with other people, okay? Um, so you, you get the synergy um, and you establish friends that you'll have for years. And a lot of people wind up doing deals, you know, back and forth together and that. Um, one of the things that I do is I supply all the food. So uh, your tuition includes the food. One of the biggest complaints we have is that people gain 10 pounds in the four days. But seriously, it's really good food. And, and the, the Radisson Hotel is like an iconic hotel. I shouldn't tell you this, but years ago, I went to my prom dinner at that hotel because it had the revolving restaurant at the top. And so 
we go up to the 16th floor and it has a great view of the city and everything. And so we go up there for lunch and dinner. We have a continental breakfast and it's just, it's, it allows you time to meet with everybody and get to know one another. And you really kind of wind up as kind of like a family because you get to know everyone. And the thing is that, you know, I will tell you that my most successful students are the ones who come to the academy. And the reason is, even if you have never done a deal before, when you, after all the role playing and the examples that we go through, and you're talking and living and eating and breathing and sleeping notes for four days, you feel like a professional. You feel like you've got experience. So when you leave there on Monday morning, you're ready to start doing some deals. So if you are serious about doing notes, carve out four days and plan to come. I mean, seriously, it is, it is the event to come to if you want to do notes. And, you know, I have people ask me, well, you know, I've, I've never done notes. Will I be lost? Well, one of the things that we offer, we've got a special going on right now. The, um, the early bird special, good through the end of this year, is $1,597. And that's a savings of $900, okay? So $1,597, is that right, Matthew? Through the end of this month, you said, you said through the end of this year. I was just saying through the end oh, of the thank you. <laughs> through the end of the month, thank you. I'm glad you're, you're staying on top. <laughs> so um, at any rate, the 1597, it includes the 2017 media set. And that media set is uh, it contains all the videos, all the audios, and a downloadable manual from last year's Academy. Now you might think, well, shoot, if I've got that, why should I come to the, the live event? Well, I I'm giving that to you to prepare for the live event so that you can get the most out of it. So people are already starting to watch the videos from last year. They've been studying, they've been getting out the calculator and stuff. And trust me, we're gonna go through all this at the Academy but you'll be light years ahead if you've already gotten a feel for things and now you're hearing it for the second time around, okay? And not to mention, you're not gonna get the synergy, you're not gonna make the friends, you're not gonna have the fun by sitting at home and watching the videos, but the information is there to help you to learn. So even if you are a new person to notes and you've never calculated anything before, I start at the beginning, I do everything step by step, so then I get other people that'll say, well, wait a minute, you know, I've been buying notes for five or 10 years. Let me tell you, I've got lots of experienced note buyers that can't wait to come to the academy because I take you from the very beginning stuff to some of the more sophisticated things. I mean, I, I'm doing options with notes. We use trust uh, to buy the notes. Um, we do the wraps. I, do, I love partials. I mean, there's so many really cool things that you can do. So um, there's something for everyone. I would say, you know, who should come? If you are interested in making some extra money, if you appreciate the, the security of real estate, but you don't want the headaches of dealing with the tenants, the trash, the toilets, you definitely should come. If you are looking to build a real estate portfolio and you want to be able to buy properties at the best pop possible price, you should come. If you're will wanting to build an IRA, the fastest, easiest, safest way, I'm telling you there's no better way to, to do it than with notes, okay? Um, so it doesn't matter. And, and maybe you already have. You know where a lot of my people come from? There are people who are real estate investors, maybe own 50 properties already, and they are sick of dealing with the property. They're tired of dealing with tenants and all the headaches that go with it. And so they, their big thing is, hey, why didn't I know about notes before? I never would have bought the property to begin with, okay? So if you already are a landlord and you own properties, you definitely need to come because this is going to open up a whole new world for you of like if you're if you're ready to downsize or if you just want to convert from the the real property to the the um to the notes so that it's more passive for you that's perfect um so there really is something for everyone okay uh so whatever your goal is if it involves you know, wanting to make money, wanting to be successful, looking to change your life, 
by all means, I hope you'll clear your schedule and come. And check out uh, thenotebuyer.com, and um, I'll be happy to, uh, would love for you to come. Matthew, I saw that you put a note up there. Somebody else had another question. If we find a non-performing note and want to resell it, do I know any investors that would be interested? I, I definitely do. But here is my problem. I don't have the time to put the deal together. And that sounds so terrible. But you need to understand that I have hundreds of students that I work with. I have thousands of students, but I'm saying hundreds active, okay? And, <clears throat> excuse me, one second here. So with the seller carrybacks, I have that all systematized. I can easily handle a large pipeline of seller carryback notes. But when if I'm going to refer a non-performing note to an investor, I need to take the time, which is a good hour, go through the whole deal, check it out, put everything together. I'm going to put together an executive summary, which could take a couple hours. And it just takes up too much time. It's not that I don't want to help you. It's that I ha my investors rely on me to scrutinize the deal. Okay, and I don't have the time to do that on the non-performing notes. That's why I don't do non-performing notes. So I, I'm sorry that I can't help you with that. However, keep in mind, there is a whole chapter in the Note Buyer's Master Guide on how to develop your own investor base, and you need to be doing that. Okay, you definitely need to be doing that. Matthew, would you put your note back up, please? Um, and and as I said before, I don't coach on non-performing notes anymore for that specific reason, because there's just not enough hours in the day for me to handle those. When I had seven people working for me, that was a different story, but that's not the case anymore. Um, I will, uh, the rest of these, I think I would prefer just to email just because they're not common to everybody and I don't want to take up everybody's time. Um, so I think that uh, I've kind of said everything I had in mind to say. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope you have a good feel for where you want to start. Um, again, if you're brand new, I certainly would start with the seller carrybacks. Um, but there's a lot to be said for the non-performing notes. And we cover both of them at the Academy. Okay, I spent almost a whole day on Saturday uh, talking about the non-performing notes. So... Thank you for joining me this Friday night. And you know what? I think maybe we'll do it again next Friday night. Uh, send your questions to me and we'll maybe do another Q&A and we'll keep this up. It seems like everybody's really enjoying it. We've had a great response. So thanks for being with me. I hope this has been helpful to you. Email me your questions. Thanks a lot and good night.